Good evening. You know, for a lot of people, uh, the 2022 season ended a month and a half ago. But for the Penn State football staff, things never stop. So for last month, they've been out on the road recruiting. And now in February, they're getting the first chance normally in the schedule to really take a deep dive and to assess what they did last year, what they're good at, and how they can improve. So I thought it'd be fun if we did the same thing. We're not going to get into formations and did you have three into the boundary at the 50 yard line? And how many times did you call scat motion? And we're not doing any of that. We're going to do some high level stuff. Look at some interesting stats, some uh, other things that we've noticed from the year that was. And then we're going to project that forward. Where can Penn State improve? What does their current staff and their current players, what can they do? to help improve some of these uh, things that we found when looking at the film and at the data. That's all coming up on the BWI Daily Edition. I'm Thomas Frank Carter. Help me get all of that stuff done, because that's, that's some heavy lifting. Is uh, Sean Fitz, speaking of heavy lifting, a guy that can carry his weight around here. Fitz, how you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Didn't lift today, actually. So uh, getting getting it out now is uh, is a way to get that that exercise in. So, no, I'm excited to talk about it. There's a lot of things that Penn State, if they can get where they want to be, where they think they can be in this window that seems to be approaching them, there's uh, there's things that they got to take care of. So I'm excited to talk about it. So this will be a little bit of analytics, a little bit of data analysis, but also this is built off of things we've observed while watching Penn State football. This isn't just just numbers, but there's going to be a lot of that tonight. And then some things that I think Fitz and I have noticed and things that we've talked about here on the BWI Daily Edition throughout the last couple of months. We're going to we're going to put a little bit of a finer point on some of those things. Um, and then, like I said, Fitz is going to help us project forward, look at the roster. Can some of these things sustain themselves? And uh, if you want to get into the conversation, we'd love to have you. First off, like the video and subscribe here to Blue White Illustrated on YouTube. We are inching our way closer to 10,000 subscribers. Appreciate everybody who's uh, been a part of that process. Uh, but if, what, do, what do you think Penn State was good at last year? Leave your comment uh, in, in the chat. We'll get to all of that today. And if you want to donate to the channel, Super Chats are open. They're always open. And we appreciate that very much. Uh, so let's start with the offense because offense is sexy and everyone loves offense fits. Um, from a high-level perspective, what do you think were one or two of the best things that Penn State did last year uh, from, the, from just generally what the offense was able to accomplish throughout the season? You know, you take a look at all the stats, and the one thing that jumps out to me, the red zone offense and its efficiency, you know, actually turning those threes into sevens, you know, which is something that they really were terrible at in in 2021. Um, 17th nationally, they scored uh, 90%, uh, 90% of the times in the in the red zone. It's just, I don't want to say that's, that's another level, but considering what we were used to in the prior couple of years, that was a big thing for me is like when you got down there and, and, Yes, the kicking game was a little bit shaky, so you maybe got a little a little testier and, and and made some calls based on that. Um, but yeah, you you were able to finish, and I know we're going to get into the T formation and things like that, and the short yardage and all that kind of stuff because that's all part of it. Um, but their ability to finish in the, in the red zone and do it without you know that Allen Robinson guy, do it without yeah. the go to receiver that you can just throw it up to and he can make plays. I think is impre- is pretty impressive. So. Um, you know, Sean Clifford, his, his hallmark was efficiency. Um, you know, it wasn't always the case, um, you know, throughout his entire career, obviously ended on a high note, but that's what he was going for. And by the end of his career, you know, they cleaned so many things up in the red zone. I think that was very impressive. I, one of my favorite things that they stopped doing was running the quarterback so much inside the 10 yard line, because that had been one of, to me, the biggest frustrations watching this offense was they get down on the goal line and the numbers say one thing, right? So the quarterback is an advantage in the run game and no no disrespect, unless it's Sean Clifford, like you're not asking him to be the guy that runs a guy over. And even when you had Will Levis, like they became a little bit obvious about what they were doing i'm thinking back especially in 2020 some of those things were pretty frustrating and and the play calling i think developed around these players the part that i find interesting is you mentioned sean clifford's efficiency uh new quarterback and i think most people would think of clifford as a 
detractor on the offense, but I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Do you think they can replicate that with a strong running game and a new quarterback under center? How do you think that they'll be able to, do you think they can replicate this next year with the same level of cashing in when they get down there in the red zone? I think it's possible, but they're going to have to do it in different ways. Um, obviously, you always had the threat of Sean Clifford running, and you know we joke a lot about his his ability and his ability to do that. But he was, you know, better than average at at finding gaps, finding the end zone, finding first downs, especially. Um, so, really interested to see how they take away and sort of take that off of Drew Aller's plate, put it on those running backs, because we think those running backs, or we know those running backs, we've seen those running backs that can handle it. And then you look at the weapons around there. Uh, Dante Cephas will play into that. Theo Johnson uh, is a guy that you would like to go to for that. Brenton Strange, uh, you know, we talk about things that you're going to miss more than you think. Brenton Strange is going to be one of those guys. Um, for just sure. definitely, you have to replace him as a blocker, replace him as a red zone threat. Uh, I think four or five touchdowns in the first half of the season this year. I mean, he was just always there and always doing things right. So you're going to have to find a different way to make it work, but you've got the pieces to do it. So take off of that Aller plate, put it back on the running backs, the uh, the offensive line, obviously more experienced uh, coming back. You've got to replace Scruggs, obviously, but uh, you know, you, you've got a lot of pieces that seem to you know benefit your overall team, but I think the red zone pieces are there as well. Um, you know, uh, can Trey Wallace be that guy that can go up and get that jump ball? I know we hate the, the red zone fade. I hate the red zone yeah. fade. And I was a receiver that was basically exclusively red zone fades at one point. So uh, it's uh, it's one of those things where I think if you can you can find that balance, you should be okay um, to replace what you're losing. Um, the, the, the thing that Sean Clifford, and just going to beat this one to death here, but the thing that he did so well was the, were those pre-snap adjustments. And yeah. Um, you're you're going to have to deal without that for at least a, a little while until to until excuse me until Drew Aller gets his feet wet and uh, and is able to go. You, you mentioned Brenton Strange, and I think that that is an underrated loss for this team. And maybe maybe it's not underrated, but uh, one of my favorite things from Mike Yursich this year, and I think I've talked about this before. One of the things I think that I misunderstood for this offense in the first half of the year was how much Theo Johnson meant to the to the offense in particular, but those two tight ends in general, what they had in store with the formational uh, things they could do. Right, I loved yeah. watching what they could do with those two tight ends, uh, not just in the running game, but also in the passing game, parlaying that into some explosive plays by getting guys up the seam that you weren't expecting or from uh, you know just the balance they were able to play with both literally and then run pass. Do you think that they have a guy that can be an H back this year to replicate what Brenton Strange did for this team? You know, it's I think it's going to take a little bit, but the way that they use those guys, they just put them everywhere, and that's the, yeah. the and I think that you're not losing as much going from Strange and Johnson to you know Johnson and Warren. Uh, maybe you get a little Khalil Dinkins mixed in there. Maybe you get Jerry Cross to make some strides or Rappelier, as we've been talking about for a while now. Um, so I'm excited to see how they make those like those concessions and, and and go with the guys that they have. Warren, I think they've showed that they're confident in him. They, there's been times when maybe a little bit too confident in in what he brings to the table as a third tight end. Um, but uh, you've got you've got so many things going for you from an athletic perspective, from a size perspective. Those guys are big. Um, you're going to miss the blocking of Renton Strange, which he could block, you know, he could block from an H back spot. He could block with his hand down. He could block from a fullback. Yep. You know, I think he was that guy in the T formation. He could just block from everywhere on the field. Yep. You've got guys that you think can catch the ball from everywhere on the field, but can they turn around and, and, and be a dual threat tight end from anywhere on the field? I think that's the question that you still have to, to answer because, We've seen some really good things from these guys, but we haven't seen the complete game that, that Brenton Strange was able to put together. And that leads me to Tyler Warren specifically. He is the guy that I think everyone expects to step into the role, um, at least initially. And I know that you and I are very high on Andrew Rappelier. Rappelier has the body type and he has the movement skills of an H-back. D Tyler Warren has always been this fascinating tweener he's six six he's much more built physically like an inline tight end but i don't know that he has the length and i don't know that he has everything there to be you know that why plus that's where theo johnson is so um the i, I guess the thing i've been realizing kind of here throughout all this is like maybe these are the wrong questions but it is what we have to go off of because uh, mike yersich is very creative so he's going to find a way to do this but with the personnel and the strengths that they have for a one-for-one -one comparison, though, 
Um, can he? Do you think he can be that H back, or do you think that they'll have to adapt to what they have? I think they'll have to adapt. Um, you know, I, I, he's at, he, he's he's more athletic than we probably give him credit for. He's one of those guys, uh, core special teamers that can you know you can, you can run all over the field, and he does a great job with that. It's just we haven't seen him do that in a complete uh, sense. So I think uh, adaptation is the way to go. Um, you know, at, at that size, at that athleticism, he should be able to do it. He can. I think he can. I think it's within him to do that. So I'm really, uh, really excited to see what uh, what Warren can put together. And like I said, I'm. I don't want to say like uh, intrigued by the third tight end battle because it is the third tight end battle. But right. heard good things out of Dinkins, uh, Jerry Cross. I didn't expect to hear as much. Um, as, as probably I've heard this, this off season. Um, but he has been a, you know, one of those guys that people pointed to and then Rappelier. I just, I think he's the most complete looking guy in there, but he's not on campus yet. He's not wearing pads yet. He's not doing any of this stuff yet that we can actually, you know, turn around and say that this guy can make, can, can get on the field and pass these guys as easily as we kind of set him up to do so. So that's, uh, that's an interesting thing because Yersich has thrown three tight ends out there. It's yep. just y- last year you had strange Johnson, Warren, gap and then dinkins was down there do you just go with uh with excuse me with johnson warren gap and then just go from there or do you work a third guy in there um that's fascinating with the way that they can move those guys around because tight ends are just so versatile so effective i mean you you really you're a receiver you're a fullback you're kind of everything there so and, and they've got the pieces that i think can make it work it's 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 about finding um, the ways that you can make up with strange again, giving a little bit and then getting it back with those, those bigger guys in Johnson and Warren. Uh, Michael McCullen is here. He, uh, is a fan of the show. He's a super fan of the show and he, he gave us a super chat. So awesome, dude. Appreciate you so much. We want to get to your question right away. So Michael says, do you feel Penn state made strides f- forward with in game adjustments this past year? And he also says, let's get this channel over 10,000. Fitz is repping the new trail and T Frank with the increasingly sweet beard. You always have the most fascinating t-shirts. What, what is it? New trail brewing. What, what do you got on today? Yeah, this is a, uh, this is a new trail brewing shirt from uh, Williamsport. Big fan of theirs. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, um, I'm surprised. Oh, I guess it's got the logo right there. Okay. I, I wasn't <laughs> sure where, where it was on this shirt, but uh, yeah, I like to uh, I like to go comfortable on these, sh- on these shows. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, big beer guy. I'm not, I'm not a drink during the week type guy, but uh big fan of theirs. So um in terms of increasingly sweet think? beard i guess you're 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 doing okay there um you got some work to do but that's that's beside <laughs> the point um in game adjustments in the past year um yeah i mean it's uh the problem with with evaluating in game adjustments is that we often value how did you get burnt and why didn't you change that that yeah. sort of thing so um probably a little bit overstated but uh they they've done some nice things uh you take a look at the games that killed them. Obviously, Michigan, uh, Ohio State. Ohio State, not really an adjustment game. I, I really think that they did a good job accounting for what Ohio State did. You just yep. gave them the ball a couple of times. Yep. Michigan, a little bit different. Uh, the gap soundness was something that, that that played throughout there, and they didn't really shut that down, and that's what burnt them. So um, I, I go back to what Peyton Manning said a couple weeks ago, like in-game adjustments, halftime adjustments and things like that, a, a little bit overrated things that, that you don't get until you get the film on, on Sunday, you don't get into that until the next week. So in-game adjustments, probably not as prevalent as you would think, but I, I thought they did a good job. I mean, you, you yeah. look at some of the things like down the stretch and that's really what's fresh in my mind is down the stretch without Parker Washington, you start slow, you find yourself in a situation where you don't have the weapons you think you have. You got to make a change. You go, you know, with a hot hand at running back. You go to Allen uh, with the, you know, he was he was phenomenal in a couple of games, and Singleton kind of disappeared, and that's okay. You can have that when you've got a guy playing at, at a high level, and the other guy, you know, you just kind of pass him off. So I think those are the kind of adjustments. I think they're very good at finding personnel adjustments more so than X's and O's scheming. And, and you know, if yes. you if you change this guy, you know, you'll find yourself in a better position. I think the personnel, and this is college football, it's it's about talent. I think that's what they do best. Yeah, I I think you nailed it there. And what I was going to add to that is that, you know, kind of in the running back situation, their roles flipped and changed a little bit throughout the year. And I think with with Catron Allen, he became a really good gap runner. So they leaned into that where he's reading and he's cutting and he's making a lot of really good plays with vision and, and the patience you need to set up those gap runs. 
where Nick Singleton, uh, you know, some of his zone running at the end of the year, where once he got the feel for zone running, that's where you get those explosive plays. And him, especially in outside zone. And I am just, I'm a fanboy of outside zone, if you can't tell, because it leads to these explosive runs when you have these hyper athletic running backs that can plant and go. And I think that the accentuation of those strengths is kind of the in game adjustment. The other game I would point to is Minnesota. Because that was a game where they went three and out pretty early. And after the game, I asked James Franklin about in-game adjustments or how do you even know what to adjust to? Because we, we take it for granted that like, okay, you aren't scoring, you didn't get yards, you have to adjust. But you're adjusting all the time as you're finding out information. It's a game of clue of, okay, what are we doing this week? What is, as James Franklin called it, the blitz of the week from your opponent? You've got to learn that stuff before you can make the adjustment. So it's not an instantaneous thing. And one of the things that's going to get to something that I think was a a struggle for this offense, even throughout the end of the season, was they were hot or cold. Like uh, they started three and out too many times and didn't get that information. So I went back through the, the chart of the number of three and outs. I went through all of their drive charts, 41 three and outs this season or Uh, A drive that didn't go three plays and 10 yards and ended in a turnover. So if you fumble on the second play of that drive, I counted that as a three and out. You know, I had to I had to tally that up myself. So I don't know where they rank nationally. But in a lot of these games, it was early. They would go three and out. It would just be they would be nothing. And then suddenly they'd get stuff together. They put together the drives and then they would get some points. So I think maybe that even answers Michael's question a little bit better about in-game adjustments is, they weren't getting yards early and then they were able to get yards late. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, it, it wasn't quite all or nothing, but like those things where you've got, uh, you know, that, that two and a half minute drive, as opposed to the three and out, those things add up. And I think yes. that that's what, that's what they would get to, particularly in the second quarter. You saw how, how successful Penn state was in the, in the, in that quarter. So I think that that's really, you know, it, it's, the game of chess is not move for move. It is setting someone up, feeling someone out, and then going for that. In the first quarter, you know, Penn State scored about half the time on their first uh, first drive, um, mm-hmm. which is pretty good. You'll take that. Um, but at the same time, those other halves, you know, it's not like it was a situation. I remember looking, looking at this in the end of the season. It's not like it was a situation where you – started slow and then you were toast you know it was one of those situations where they they got into it and and even in games when they didn't like there were games that they they lost you know the games that they lost they scored right off the bat as well so yeah um you've got uh you've got something that you can work with there and i think that that's that's really when you're talking about the in-game adjustments is setting it up so i guess that's uh i I guess that answers the question i don't know it's it's so tough to think about think about because it it just comes down to those two games and you kind of wash everything else out and the game that they didn't quote unquote adjust for is the game that they end up getting blown out of the big house so that's uh that's not going to make people feel feel all that much better yeah and that was a game where they didn't have a lot of drives you know again going back to that game script of michigan held the ball four and five evers during that game real quick because i do want to get to a couple other things you didn't like that? I thought I love that one. I say that one all me, the time. It took me a second, and I just was like, <laughs> "All right, move on to the." Uh, yeah. uh, with again, with a new quarterback, uh, is this a thing that you would be concerned about with uh, placing more emphasis on in-game adjustments, or like you said, like we got to keep things simple for the quarterback to start, and maybe we'll try and switch things up around him to make it work better. Yeah, at least to start. I mean, I think you got to get with that. Um, I'm not saying script more plays, but the the less you can put on his plate from a thinking perspective, um, get him confident and go from there. I think is the way to uh, is the way to approach that. But I will say this: more uh, more measured than we expected him, especially in the early part of the season when he was kind of forced into action, especially at that Purdue game. Um, I don't want to say more poised, but like more comfortable than we thought he would be, just based mm-hmm. on what on the feedback and stuff like that. So. You know, I, I'm fully confident that he could do it. It's just you want to get him, get his feet wet in, with with actual defense in front of him. You know, West Virginia, I don't think he's going to be a very good team this year, but it's still going to be a Division One defense in your face. So you're going to have that uh, uh, to go back on. So I think that that's what you need to do. The schedule kind of sets you up okay from that perspective to uh, to move forward. So I, I do think that uh, you take a little bit off his plate just to get him comfortable and, and then go from there. And I think that that's... 
ideal for him. You know, it was just because uh, when he's when he's confident, we saw it in his high school tape. When he's confident, he thinks he can do everything, and he has the talent to do most things to back it up. So I'm I'm curious to see how that uh, all comes together. And I think Yurisich has done this before, you know, just with uh, inexperienced quarterbacks and mm-hmm. feel those guys out and and, and put them in the spots that uh, that make them comfortable. Um, you know, you've got a different skill set. You've got a different talent level here. And I, and I think he's going to be able to adjust to that. And that's kind of what he does. Uh, it's kind of his hallmark. I mean, we, we talk about in-game adjustments, but adjusting to his personnel is something that that took a little bit longer here than people think. I think people thought it would. Um, but he he did that last year, especially down the stretch. This is the BWI Daily Edition. I'm Thomas Frankard. That is Sean Fitz. Uh, we're live, so if you want to ask some questions in the chat, love to have you on the show. Michael isn't the only one. Don't be shy. Come on, step up. And like the video, as always. But make sure you subscribe. BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. That's where you get all the good stuff, all the inside information, the things you cannot, literally, you cannot get anywhere else. You get them at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. On the Lion's Den Premium Message Forum and id uh, premium content from all of our exceptional writers. So subscribe now. Twenty nine ninety nine to the beginning of the football season, and uh, that's a deal. Let me tell you about that. With all the information, you're going to be the smartest Penn State football fan if you sign up for Blue White Illustrated. Uh, the other thing I need to tell you about is our sponsor of the show, who is Rogue Shop. I love Rogue Shop. They are a small batch premium cannabis uh, farm in Wisconsin. They produce holistic medicine. For I'm not I'm not trying to sell you weed here. This is a medication to help you with your life. Um, I've talked to you about all of these things from my perspective of I have a hard time st- sleeping and staying asleep. But it's not just for that. It's for chronic inflammation. It's for anxiety. If you have anxiety or panic attacks, if you have chronic pain, all of these things reducing and making your life easier with THC and CBD, things that are are shown to help with those things. And by the way. I think I said this last week, but I just want to reiterate this. Like, I'm not coming from like years of experience. When we started with Rogue Shop, that was my introduction to all of this. So hopefully for Richard's sake and for Mr. Rogue and his wife, Shar, uh, I'm doing a great job telling you about it. And if I am, use the promo code BWI for 10% off at rogueshop.com. That's R-O-G-U-E shop.com. 10% off uh, to let them know you're coming from the daily, from the live show, and uh, to get yourself a deal on uh, stuff that can help you live a better life. And to me, that is why we're all here, is to live a good life. So we have another question here in the chat. Let's see. We got Steven is back. He says, happy Wednesday. Uh, with Blue White Illustrated. Random February Wednesday, where else would you rather be? Um, we got another question here. I don't know. Uh, it won't be as prevalent as in the past, but how much will the RPO will we see with Aller? What do you think of the RPO usage with a young quarterback and with his skill set in particular? Yeah, I think I think it'll stick. Um, I'll be honest with you. RPO, a four-letter word for some people just because yeah. the Fully don't grasp um, how much it does for your for your offense and with the weapons that they have. I mean, this is this is not going to be a situation where we're seeing him pulling his own read, you know, five ten times a game like we saw yeah. with Sean Clifford at times. Um, but that RPO opens so many things up. And uh, you know, w- when when you talk about what uh, Mike Yersich looks for in quarterbacks, snap decisions, good decisions is is right at the top of his list. And I think that that Aller's a smart kid; he can handle that. Um, do you put it all on his plate? The same conversation we just had a couple minutes ago. Do you put it all on his plate right away? Probably not. But I think that yeah. it's definitely here to stay. It will definitely help him out. And I and, and when you think RPO, a lot of times you think of the uh, the quick throws over the middle or things like that. I, I like this with the screen game, especially with Aller. He can get the ball out there quick, get it out yeah. to Keandre Lambert Smith on the edge, and make them um, you know sort of have to uh, make it just make it a numbers game. So that's what I'm probably most anxious to see is how Yursich works that in. I, I don't think it, I don't think it changes all that much uh, between Sean Clifford and Drew Aller. If we're if we're being honest, yeah, I I agree with you on that sense. And here's the thing that I I think is misunderstood about the RPO is that it is somehow detrimental to the offensive line. And I had this conversation, and it's just read option, spread offense, RPO, they're all kind of mixed into the same pot because they're all they're all kind of on the same level of new, and they're all happening at the same time. 
Right. Um, so for those that don't know what RPO means, it's a read pass option where you have, uh, I'm sorry, run pass option where you have the read of uh, a key defender on the field. And depending on what that defender does, formation or strength, you can pull the ball on a run play and throw it to a receiver. The only people running an RPO are the quarterback and the receiver. Everyone else is run blocking. It's just a run play. So the run, the offensive line doesn't have to worry about any of that. They just have to run block. And this is the thing I think is interesting about uh, USB Calzone's question is, if you've got a really good run game, that opens up bigger holes because you're afraid of Nick Singleton and Catron Allen. So they should use RPO next year. It should make it easier for Drew Aller because those underneath defenders get sucked into the offensive line and you have giant windows to throw into. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that would be a good thing for them to use uh, next year. A couple other things that I wanted to get to for the offense, and we can get through some of these quickly because uh, we do want to talk about the defense. Now, we talked about three and outs. Uh, first down. This was another problem for Penn State previously. And this is another one of these, uh, let's let's only trust my crunching of numbers so far. But here's what we have. 159 yard, uh, 154 passing attempts on first down. 239 rushing attempts. Um, so clearly run over pass on first down. And they averaged almost six yards per attempt on first down. So a big improvement on first down plays, setting up some of the other metrics that we have of having a good third down conversion rate because they got six yards on first down. Um, imperative to keep that up, I think. It would be, an, but the run to pass ratio, that's something that I find interesting. What, what do you make of that with Mike Yursich, who's got this downfield passing attack, known for big passing plays, but has this thing where kind of a traditional offense coordinator likes to run on first down? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you saw that evolve. By the way, um, next time go with the bullet points because I I was reading minus five point nine yards per, oh. per first down, <laughs> and that threw me off just a bit. Um, I, I was wondering that. if I missed something. I know I missed uh, some first downs, uh, getting getting food and stuff uh, coming into the second half, but uh, I didn't think I was that far behind. Anyway, um, yeah, the, the split was a little bit bigger than we're used to seeing. Um, I think that comes down to the options that you had in the backfield. Um, you know, you, you, I, th I would guess that if you went back and looked at 2021's numbers, they were at least closer to 50-50, if not uh, slanted toward the pass. Um, so I was uh, I was happy to see that because I do like the first down when you, when you have the ability to to be effective on first down. And that's really what it, what it all comes down to. It's not about uh, hitting the big plays. It's not about that. It's about getting yourself in position, uh, down in distance, staying on schedule. And they did a tremendous job this year compared to the prior two years. And that's yeah. kind of a, a, a low see you know, a low ceiling to hit. Um, but they, they did a tremendous job of staying on schedule and, uh, you know, that's when they're at their best, really. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't rely on the 80 yard run, uh, by Nick Singleton and things like that. So, uh, when you've got the guys that you have, um, and you've got the sort of the, 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 the way that they spread out the field is a little bit different than, uh, than, uh, traditional, uh, offenses like this. So I just, uh, I, I was okay with, okay with the way they did it. They did it. I think you've probably yeah. got more numbers on that. Um, just, uh, as I talk myself here in circles, I, I, th I think the split was a little bit bigger than you expect, but they, yeah. they were effective in doing so. It, it's, I think you, you bring up a good point about the personnel and, you know, putting yourself in giving your best players the ball early in the sequence. Um, the, the, I guess the, the, predictability of it we had message board members this is the reason i bring this up is because we have message board members i've had this conversation with them all season long of like there's a lot of runs on first down uh, my curiosity and this is what i have to ask mike you at some point is like what is the value so there has been this analytical pushback on running on first down because the average pass play gets you six yards the average run play gets you four and a half so that's really kind of the the impetus for the the conversation around first down runs. But there's got to be some reason other than just dependability and predictability of getting at least two yards with a running play um, of the reason why you want to run to establish something on first down. One of the things that I thought uh, Mike Yersich did very well was play sequencing. And a lot of that does come off of action in the run game. It looks like one thing, we either pull and boot or we're gonna do something different and make it a play action, some of those things. So I'm just curious about that particular conversation. Yeah, the, the, oops, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, the, and the type of run matters. I think you're kind of, kind of going into this. You remember what Penn State's first play in the Rose Bowl was, it was John Clifford on a run, you know? And, yeah. and that's 
to set something else up. And I think that's that's what they did pretty well this year was set them up and change the way that defenses had to play them, change how your safeties are aligning just based on the quarterback run and then going from there. So it wasn't always just, uh, you know, back when when I was in school, it was, you know, handoff to uh, to Larry Johnson. You know, it, it was going to happen on first down. That's that's basically yeah. how things went. The, this is a little bit more variety. This is a little bit more uh, who's carrying the ball. You know, a run play is not necessarily the running back. It's the quarterback getting into it. Um, you know, you throw some some sweeps in there and things like that. So I think that that the variety and setting themselves up for for other um, other plays, other personnel groups and things like that, it, it, that that comes into it so sorry for stepping on you but i think you're heading in that direction anyway so yeah i also wanted to get to the offensive line quickly because that plays a part in this um you don't want to put the offensive line in a bad situation obviously passing in some of these uh, some of these downs and distances uh because last year they took a step forward but i was looking at some of the trying to isolate the the offensive line and maybe some of their um contributions to negative plays they were good, you know, production of all the yards and stats we're talking about, but four and a half tackles per loss, uh, tackles for loss per game, 29th. So, you know, kind of in the middle of the pack of the top 25, top 50, uh, and then 40th with 21 sacks allowed. They were tied with Notre Dame for, uh, I think, lower than you'd want. Are those okay, or do those have to improve with this offensive line next year in terms of allowing negative plays or is that just kind of the baseline for offensive lines as we've talked about with most of them operate in this sort of fashion? Yeah, I think that, I think it's the latter, to be honest with you. I think it's, okay. I, I think it's fine. Um, you know, offensive lines are going to be not less good than the defensive lines they're playing, but that's kind of the way that the game has shifted is, you know, the, the defense has that advantage. So I think those are fine. Uh, 29th nationally in, in tackles for loss, to, you know, per game you can live with that. Like that's, uh, yeah. that's part of the game. I mean, when you look at the other side and what Penn state was doing, piling up those tackle for loss numbers on defense, you feel a lot better about that. So there's that. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think that this offensive line is capable, you know, I don't, I don't think it's overpowering or anything like that. The other thing I'll go back to is where was this offense or how much faith did you have in this offense, you know, going on second and 10. And, and that's really, yeah where that run play, you know, that, that run selection comes into play is you feel better about second and six than second and 10. Even if you get a first, you know, even if you get a completion on first down where you get another first down, I mean, you put yourself in a hole by throwing it. And, and to be honest with you, looking at the last couple of years, you didn't ha exactly have the most confidence in, in that passing game. So I think yeah. that that's what it comes down to is putting yourself on schedule. And that's really where Mike Yersich likes to operate. Uh, Michael brings up a really interesting point. This will be the last thing on the offense. I've spent probably five minutes more than I meant to on the offense. I'd love to see Penn State adopt a four-down philosophy that worked so well for the Eagles all season. They were 70% on fourth down, sixth in the nation. So I, I don't know that they were as aggressive as the Eagles, but Fitz, they were pretty aggressive, weren't they? I, they were not uh, unafraid of going for it on fourth and short. Yeah, I saw that comment. And I was like, they they were fine. Like they were more than fine to be honest with you. And then and when they got that uh that T formation working, like yeah. that became a weapon. Like we talked about the, the there's there's a difference between, you know, getting that yard and getting so much more that Nick Singleton was able to get eventually. Um and they were a missed block from from Sal Wormley in the Ohio State game away from, you know, just making uh, from breaking another one. So yeah. 70%, I think you'll take that. You know, you've got uh yeah. you've, you've got a lot to like there. So and and the next comment after that is is absolutely right too. This ain't the Eagles offensive line. Like you can yeah. do you can do more <laughs> yeah. with what they were able to put together out there and I think that's relevant here in the college game. Yeah, Losi's mustache is back. Uh he does have another question here. Um and this for for real though, last thing we'll talk about with the uh, with the offense. God forbid they have an Iowa game at the running back position. I think he means with losing players at that position. Um, is Lena Montgomery realistically ready? What about Wallace? Or do we have walk on uh, take snaps if both the top guys are injured? So doomsday, uh, de you know, let's let's go with, with worst case scenario. What's in the bunker for running back fits? I I don't lean on London Montgomery to be ready. Um, just based, yeah. you know, in, in August is when he got hurt. 
he had the uh, the surgery in the fall. Um, that's a lot to come back from, especially for a guy that, uh, you know, running backs tend to use their legs. So that's, uh, yeah. that's one of those things. Cam Wallace, I think, would be the guy to look to in that situation. And then you're on Tank and Holdsworth. I mean, there's not much beyond there. That's why we've talked about in the spring uh, period, maybe trying to find a running back out there. So uh, doomsday scenario, um, which is definitely possible in this uh, in this game, this uh, this game today. Um, is not great. I'll be honest with you. So, uh, do you do you move somebody around? Um, do you find somebody that can potentially play that role? Um, looking at it, I don't know that there's a ton of people that can fill that role. Um, but do you, you would you would have to uh, have to get creative there, and then lean on your passing game, lean on those other yeah. guys um, because that would be that would be very very tough. Um, again, I, I don't know. You, you talked to London Montgomery last week. He seems confident in his in his comeback and things like that. But that's that's a lot to come back from in a year. Yeah. And not he also only... wouldn't put a timeline on it. Like when I asked, he's like, I don't want to put a timeline on it. And it didn't sound like something yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he shouldn't. And uh, I mean, like Tamir Robinson has been off of football for 16 months, 18 months or something like that. And he's just going to yeah. have to get back into it. Like it, it's not about. Um, okay, are you 100%? Are you fully healed? That's great. Um, but then you have to train like a college athlete around yep. other college athletes to compete with college and against college athletes. That's the big thing. Um, so, like, I, I see him as a red shirt because of that and because of the timing and things like that. I'm very high in London, uh, Montgomery. Uh, absolutely. But at the same time, you, you got to be realistic. And that's why I think you continue to look at the portal, even though. It's not the most fruitful endeavor to bring in a third string running back that knows he's going to be a third string running back behind two really, really darn good young running backs. So that's yeah. uh, that's a tough scenario that they're in. Um, and uh, if they hit that that floor and God forbid, like that's how you start your question. God forbid they do. Um, that's going to be tough sledding. Uh, but Ken Wallace is he's a talented guy. I think that, yeah. that could he play as a true freshman? I I don't think it'd be ideal. He's 170 yeah. pounds, and you know, yeah, he's that's got the some, problem. Some work to do, but at the same time, when you take a look at his tape, uh, you don't just see the um, the running back tape. You see the defensive tape. So there's got to be an element of toughness there. There's got to be an element yep. of of, of uh, brains that are involved there. So um, you know, I don't I don't feel good about it, but I, you you would probably give him the opportunity to do so. Yeah, I think you make a good point. Or just, you know, Bo Prabula option quarterback in situations where you need to run the ball. Who knows? Get creative. Uh, let's talk about some fun stuff. Uh, let's go to the defense, what they were good at this past season. Everyone knows this, but let's put a fine point on it. Eight and a half, eight tackles for loss per game, not negative eight. I don't know where the, uh, the bullet points are in Adobe uh, Premiere yet. 43 sacks as well, so sixth nationally. So those are some damn good defensive stats to start off with. Uh, we talked, I wrote about Tig Brown and his influence, not only as a, uh, you know, multiple, multiple coverage player, but also as a blitzer, one of the best blitzing safeties in the nation last year with five sacks and got pressure like a defensive end when he rushed the passer. So, um, that defensive end room is deep. It is talented. Um, Manny Diaz, th all of this should continue, if not improve next year, this should be the strength of the team, right? You would think so. You know, they've got some things to to to, to patch up, I guess. Uh, you mentioned that they'll miss Brown more than, you know, most people would think. But I think people are expecting a, a not a not a dip there, but like Tig was so good, like so yeah. good at everything that it's going to take some time. And, you know, you get Jalen Reed back there, uh, Jalen Reed number wearing number one, by the way. Um, so you've got oh. Jalen Reed and Ellis back there. And uh, yeah, KJ Winston's a guy that I'm really excited to see. So I, I feel good about the personnel that they've got there um, at safety. But at the same time, you, you're taking taking from your top and adding adding guys uh, on the bottom there. So that's uh, always something that's going to take some time to go around. But this is college football. That's how the that's how it works. You lose the the top guys and you replace them with other guys that you hope can be top guys at some point. Um, but in terms of like, should this be the strength of the team? Yeah, it should be. I mean, you've got uh, questions at defensive tackle. Defensive end looks pretty good. Um, linebacker looks very good on the outside, and you got to figure out something at, at Mike. And then that secondary should be should be good good once again. So I'm just excited to see them play because I really really enjoyed watching this defense come together last year. Like yeah. you really enjoy them attacking, enjoy enjoy you know the the chances that they would take and and things of that nature. So. Um, they're athletic, they're, they're long. They've got some, uh, some guys in the back end that can go find the football. So that's, uh, that, that, that all makes up for a really fun defense. And one area that I think should improve because part of this 
came early in the season with a little bit of learning the defense was missed tackles. I'd say if there's one area that was a big problem early was missed tackles. Ninth in the Big Ten, according to PFF, 170, 137 missed tackles. Um, it, it, do you have a continued concern there with some of the players in the secondary? And, of course, we, we've talked long time about the, the Mike linebacker situation, but do, that number should improve as well, I would imagine, in year two. Is, is, or do you think that that's another thing that will kind of stay stable with the amount of chances they take, as you just talked about? I mean, college football, there's a, there's a lot of missed tackles. Like, it's not just a Penn State thing. This is how yeah. it works uh, throughout the country. Every fan base complains about missed tackles. They're there. Uh, they happen. Uh, we saw Utah miss some tackles. So um, I, I don't think I, I don't I don't feel too worried about it. But I will say you're replacing uh, Tig Brown with uh, with Keaton Ellis and Jalen Reed. Jalen has been more the big hitter type guy. Keaton, I think, is going to have to improve his tackling. So at the very back end, I do think that they need to make some some strides there. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, Wheatley's still young, Winston's still young, but, uh, they, they have to make some strides there. And then Mike is going to keep popping back up. Tyler Elston missed some prime tackle, like not just miss some tackles that, uh, you know, you, you forget about the ones where yeah. he's got the guy in the backfield, like the ones that stick in your mind. And I think that's yep. the biggest problem with evaluating Tyler Elston is you keep those plays like in the forefront of your mind, those missed tackles and things like that. So, um, Mike definitely has to improve in that, in that manner. And, you know, be honest with you, like, uh, Abdul Carter is a phenomenal running back or excuse me, a phenomenal linebacker, but he's got strides to make as well. Like just mm -hmm. in terms of uh, being in the right position, he can make up for it. He's kind of like Micah that, you know, you can be a step out of place and all of a sudden be in the right spot faster than the guy beside you and everybody else around you. Abdul Carter can do that. Um, but he, you know, if, if he gets, uh, where he needs to be from, uh, uh, from an intangible standpoint, from an instinct standpoint, um, that's when he's going to be really, really good. Like we saw, we saw just like the, 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 you know, the, the, the coating of the M and M here, you know, we yeah. can get to the, you can get to the, uh, the, the rich candy inner. So, um, he's going to be very good. It's just, uh, he's still got improvements to make. And, and, you know, for all the talking that we do about how great we think he can be like, that's, that remains to be seen as, is how complete of a linebacker is he going to be? You took the words out of my mouth, but with what the, I with want. With the M&M thing? No? Yes, exactly. Okay. No, I was going that. more of the Earth's core when you started with the, because the imagery is perfect. I was thinking about the Earth's crust, so I was going to go to a, you know, the Earth, the mantle, blah, blah, blah. I was thinking uh, of candy, yes. <laughs> Part of what he needs to improve on, I think, the most is his coverage. And it wasn't the easiest thing in the world because I was really impressed with Manny Diaz learning this defense and trying to absorb all of it at the same time. Um, it, it He makes it difficult on quarterbacks. They did a great job of mixing up coverages. Now, most teams don't run everything. Like, you're not going to run every single coverage and every single variant, but they had two high safety looks. They had one high safety looks. They ran cover three. They ran cover one. They ran cover two. They ran cover six a lot. I really like the way that they... Uh, made things difficult on the quarterback, and that was one area where sometimes miscommunications on the back end. Abdul Carter had a couple of them learning the different intricacies of this defense. That's an area I think they need to improve. Without Tig back there and without Joey, but at the same time, Joey Porter Jr., we saw what it looks like without him on the, at the cornerback position. A lot of that, though, has to do with your safeties. And, and when I remember... Um, Anthony Poindexter talked about, okay, when Tig's out there, we know exactly what we're doing. But when he's not out there, we have to get better at communicating and knowing all these things. That's going to be something personally I'm wondering, are they going to be able to do all these things? I know they have veterans, but do they have the guys that they can then run so many different coverages and be still in sync and still not make mistakes? So they didn't have a lot of busted plays last year. Right. And and I think the, the, the underrated thing from this aspect, and I know that he's been, you know, he came out of the Rose Bowl and everything like that. If, if you took it, and I know you posted these on the site, if you take a look at the rep count for safety, Jalen Reed's played a lot of football. Like he's, yeah. he's played a lot more than you probably think that he has. And he outsnapped Keaton Ellis last year. And those two kind of project it at, at starters, even though I think that the backups can, can cut into that. So you've uh -huh. got experience back there, but at the same time, Tig had, everything down like from he he could attack like if you put him at defensive end he could have played defensive end you know yeah. maybe not the most effective guy but like he he knew what he was doing in every spot do they have that in that group back there um with reed and with ellis i i don't know and 
the other thing is Tig could make up uh, some things, especially in coverage, where he would just, you know, find the ball. I know that's the yep. key Whitley's uh, uh, mo, but uh, he would he would be able to find the ball. So that is what you sort of, you know, that give and take that we talked about in the offense, you're taking away TIG, um, but you've got talent back there. And and if you've got talent and speed and, and length back there, you can make it work. Poindexter is a phenomenal coach. Manny Diaz has tried, as you mentioned, different safety looks, different looks all over the field. And I think it's been, that's part of the entertaining aspect of this. Um, they're physical, you know, they're fast. And Another thing is when you play essentially a, a dime defense with your outside linebackers still in because they're so athletic, that's a mm -hmm. good spot to be in. Yeah, and that leads me perfectly to the one of the last things I want to talk about, which is personnel usage and sub packages. You know, you and I both have talked about Manny Diaz and moving Curtis Jacobs back over to that field linebacker position. And I didn't expect that to happen based on years of studying his like years of film, going back and looking at things from the beginning of his time at Miami to the end of the time. Like, what does he like to do when he has his players? What does he like to do when he has, you know, guys that he's just inherited? And that was always or almost always a safety. Like very rarely was that another linebacker. And yet we find ourselves with three linebackers on the field quite a bit. One of the things I'm thinking of though this year is if you want to get one of my rules in my brain is you can't take Jacobs and uh, Carter off the field. Somebody between those two has to play Mike. Do you think we'll see an increase in those sub packages and like not trying to like find a way around this problem and uh, absconce from having Curtis, uh, Tyler Elsden or, or Kobe King on the field. But do you think we'll see more sub packages now that he's got another year under his belt and a couple more safeties in the mix? I think so because you've got time. Like that's the thing that you didn't expect. You know, when, when Abdul Carter was playing so well in September going into October, you essentially were, you had to wait to a bye week until you could get all that stuff installed. Um, and even then there's so much, there's only so much you can do in a week. So I think that now that they've got time, now that Manny's got tape on what he, you know, can figure out, I, I think you can put Abdul in that mic role and it can be very, very good. Like that's, that's what, that's something I'm excited to see. Plus yeah. you've got three corners that you think can start. Plus you've got those safeties that you can move around and things like that. So, and Daquan Hardy, of course, is, is a guy that we never talk about just because, uh, you know, he's, he's a nickel guy and we kind of put him in a different pile than the regular, um, um, than the regular corner. So I think you do have the opportunity to, when you get time, when you get these guys all on the same page and, and, you know, given them, give them an off season to work with, you have that ability more so than when you would have in September or October. Uh, last thing, and I, I'm doing the same thing. Losi's mustache. I'm, I'm putting this one on you. Ending on a down note, I think. Um, Why? Because you mentioned down Iowa? Oh. <laughs> No, right. no. Fourth down defense. As good as Penn State was on offense, they gave up 52% of fourth down conversions. Much better on third down. They were 33% on third down. What do you attribute? Is that a quirk? What do you attribute that to? Because they were good on third down. They did it. everything they needed to get in those situations. And then they just struggled there on fourth down. Is there anything you can like pin down on that? And, and how do you improve that? I, I don't without, without the numbers in terms of down and distance, like, because if you remember back to the first half of the season and maybe the first three quarters of the season, like third down defense was not that great. Third and long defense was not good at all. Like it yeah, was just like, okay. Point. Um, you'd rather have third and three than third and 16 because third and 16, they were going to hit. Um, so I, I, I don't know without the, uh, the numbers in front of me. And then, another thing like 52% on fourth down defense, 72nd in the country, um, that a lot of that's going to come down to short yardage situations. Uh, and I think, I think that that's something that Penn state needs to look at because their short yardage defense. If you take a look at the, the D tackles that are coming back, their short yardage defense is not, uh, you know, you, you don't feel very bullish on this, the short yardage defense this year. So something that they're going to have to account for, but without the numbers, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a, a, an ugly number for Penn state's defense. I think you, you, make a great point about short yardage versus uh, everything else, because that has been a problem for several years now for the Nittany Lions. And I, I saved it. Here we go. Our last thing is the app for the whole team, the average score margin, 17 and a half points per game that they won games by. So they're winning almost by 20 points. That was seventh nationally. The problem was the teams that were ahead of them were Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, and everyone else that you know about. Georgia were all ahead of them. So really great place. They beat, by the way, the eighth team in the nation right behind them in Utah in the Rose Bowl. So again, if you thought Utah was not a good team, 
they were a good team that were winning a lot of games by big margins, and Penn State was able to do that to them. So overall, like we said, it's to start. 11-2 and two team, very good. Uh, I think this is a really fun, productive way to kind of look at these different facets of here's what they're good at, here's what they're bad at, how does that project to next year. Fitz, thanks for helping me out with all of that. Of course, and I don't want to get too far into Nate's, um, you know, his credo here, but when you score more points than the other team, you're going to be successful, and Penn State went from not scoring as many points to scoring much more points than their opponents. So credit Nate on that one if you're uh, if you're writing that one down. Yeah, he gets he gets another uh, writer's credit on the show for that. That'll sure. do it today for the BWI Daily Edition. Fitz will be back tomorrow with the aforementioned Nate Bauer. Uh, that'll be our mailbag show for the week. So subscribe to Blue White Illustrated. Then you get onto the Lions Den message forum where the submission thread is on Thursday morning. So make sure you're out looking out for that early in the morning. And then if you want to, you're listening here on your podcast version on Apple Podcasts. Leave a five-star review with your question in the comments. We, we answer each of those each week. So that's how you get on the mailbag show tomorrow. You'll be the star of the show along with Fitz and Nate. That'll do it for today. We'll talk to you tomorrow.